In this video, we'll explore a key example that will enhance our understanding of diversification as well as the interplay between correlation, expected value and volatility. Additionally, this serves as an introduction to the fundamental concepts of portfolio theory. In interviews, you may be playing games where you get offered trades, for example on the result of a dice or a card game. And then you need to decide if you want to accept a trade and how much capital you want to allocate to it. Since there potentially are many options, it is a key skill to intuitively assess how to maximize your risk to reward ratio. This video starts with a bit of theory and then guides you step by step through multiple small exercises. While these will involve some formal mathematics, we encourage you to focus on interpreting the cases presented. This is particularly useful if you're not yet familiar with the formalities of probability theory. In general, aim to grasp the examples on an intuitive level. So we've divided this video into two segments. Please watch them consecutively as they offer distinct insights with the second segment building upon the first. In this part we will focus on the case of an uncorrelated bond and a stock to explain the effect of leverage. Throughout this video, we will mostly be talking about two securities and the insights we can gain through combining them in a two-asset portfolio. For this, picture this. Imagine two stocks that we track for a one-year time frame. Since there's lots of uncertainty involved in the trajectory of the stock's prices, we can't say where they will end up after one year. However, we can assume that after one year the prices will have moved according to some distribution and model this using parameters such as the mean and a standard deviation. Furthermore, in real markets it's often the case that different securities move in relation with each other. For instance, two stocks in the same sector will likely have somewhat correlated returns. To better understand this, let's consider a variety of financial products and ponder their interrelations. Although there are several methods to define correlation, such as computing correlation on daily returns or other clearly defined time spans, we use it here more as a long-term heuristic on how these products relate to each other. There exist many examples that can be used to demonstrate this. Consider for example the stock chart of Boeing in black and Airbus in yellow. Both firms operate in the aviation sector and despite being competitors are similarly influenced by general market conditions. For instance, a booming holiday season benefits both companies profit-wise. Likewise, unexpected risks like the coronavirus pandemic affect them in comparable ways. It's also important to note that their correlation isn't perfectly one, but it's slightly less. Many financial products also exhibit a slight correlation that might not be significant. For instance, Boeing shares and bonds such as US Treasuries have some interdependence but largely move independently from another. Conversely, some assets are negatively correlated. An example is buying a stock and shorting the same stock. Another less extreme case is Boeing and Zoom. When people stay at home and travel less, this affects Boeing negatively while benefiting Zoom. Though these entities may grow, they can be influenced in opposing directions by the same events. Here it's important to understand that this isn't a perfect negative correlation and short-term daily returns might even show a positive correlation. To understand the impact of correlation on our investments, let's examine the simplest form of portfolio, one comprising of just two assets, S1 and S2. In interviews and for real-world simplification, we focus on the expected values, mu1, mu2 and the standard deviations, sigma1, sigma2 of these assets. Furthermore, we consider their correlation rho. The portfolio allocation includes a weight w1 ranging from 0 to 1 for asset 1 and a weight w2 equaling 1 minus w1 for asset s2. The sum of the two weights w1 and w2 is 1 since the portfolio only consists of these two securities, s1 and s2. On the right you can see an example with w1 being about 2 thirds and w2 being 1 third. To better understand this, let's again revisit our price charts from earlier. First consider stock 1. After one year we have an expected value of stocks 1 price of mu1 and a standard deviation of sigma1. The same can be said for stock 2. Depending on the stocks chosen, mu1 and mu2 can be equivalent or distinct. The same goes for sigma1 and sigma2. 
If we now consider our two asset portfolio, this consists of some weighting of the two stocks combining them into one portfolio. Depending on the standard deviation and mean and correlation of the two individual stocks, we can now compute the standard deviation and mean of this portfolio. Let's now take our generalized two asset portfolio and calculate the expected value mu p of the portfolio. On the top you can see the values from the previous slide. The expected value mu p is the weighted average of the stocks S1 and S2. It falls somewhere between mu1 and mu2 and is independent of rho, showing a linear relationship with w1. When the portfolio is entirely composed of the first stock, meaning w1 is 1, then mu p equals mu1. As we reduce w1, the portfolio's expected value shifts closer to mu2. Next, let's determine an expression for the standard deviation sigma p of the portfolio. For this, we start by finding the variance, which is sigma p squared. To find the standard deviation sigma p, we begin with its square, the variance, sigma p squared. Using the binomial formula for variances, the variance can be expressed as the sum of the variance of the two parts, so w1 times s1 and w2 times s2. Additionally, we can include the term for two times the covariance of the two assets. When calculating, the weights w1 and w2 are squared and brought to the forefront. By definition, the covariance equals the correlation rho multiplied by the product of the two standard deviations. This last term incorporates rho, highlighting the dependency between the stocks. Unlike the linear relationship with w1 for the expected value, the variance's relationship with w1 is quadratic. Note that throughout this video, we oftentimes mix the concepts of variance, standard deviation and volatility. Typically, volatility is more of a generalized concept, whereas standard deviation is just one way that can be used to measure this. We do not clearly differentiate between these three in this video, since the standard deviation is simply the square root of the variance. That means the square root function is monotone, and that means the insights discussed in this video are invariant to whether we are talking about standard deviation or variance. Next, we will go through a few examples to see what effect different correlations have and how we can think about combinations of trades. Here we begin by assuming that S1 and S2 are completely uncorrelated. So for visual clarity, we'll plot risk against reward. This plot places the standard deviation sigma p on the x-axis and the expected value mu p on the y-axis. Then we have markers at the extremes for w1 equaling 1 and 0. Initially, we assume that both stocks have the same expected value, aligning them horizontally. The first stock is risk-free, meaning that sigma 1 is 0, and that means it appears on the y-axis, whereas the second one has a positive standard deviation. Since the standard deviation of the first stock is 0, the correlation is technically not defined, but often, out of convenience, gets set to 0. Our goal is to determine the optimal allocation between the two stocks, or trades, meaning the ideal value for w1. By applying our assumption that mu2 equals mu1 into the formula for mu p, we find that the expected value remains consistent to mu1 regardless of allocation. To find sigma p, we now apply our assumption to the formula, noting that for sigma1 equaling 0 and with uncorrelated assets, the covariance term disappears. This simplifies to the square root of the squared product of 1 minus w2 and sigma2. After simplifying, it's clear that while mu is unaffected by w1, sigma linearly depends on w1. If we plug in w1 equals 1, our portfolio only consists of stock 1. And that means our values match exactly. In other words, the mean mu p remains at mu1 and sigma p is equaling to 0. If, on the other hand, we plug in w1 equals 0, we have a portfolio consisting only of stock S2. Then, the mean once again is mu p, which is just mu2, but now sigma p equals sigma2. If we move w1 between 0 and 1, the mean stays constant and the standard deviation moves between 0, which is sigma1, and sigma2. 
This can be seen more clearly if we plot the 2D curve of mu p versus sigma p for each possible value of w1. Here we start with w1 equaling 1 at s1, and if w1 decreases, we move towards s2. The gray circle in the middle represents an equally weighted portfolio for which both weights w1 and w2 equal one half. This point lies directly in the middle between the two stocks. In a practical scenario, you can consider S1 as a risk-free, high-yield bond and S2 as a stock like Boeing. This, however, is of course just an idealized scenario, since in reality, a high-yield risk-free asset does not exist, since market forces will adjust its price to balance the yield. So, what's the optimal weighting here? Given the constant expected value, our goal is to minimize variance, suggesting an all-in investment in the theoretical risk-free bond S1. However, remember such a scenario is more illustrative than practical. Usually a higher risk needs to get compensated with a higher reward. So let's consider a scenario where the expected value of the second product exceeds the one of the first one. Take a moment to calculate both the expected value mu p and the standard deviation sigma p as we did before. If you're unsure how to do this, revisit the previous steps. Also try to draw the trajectory on our 2D map for this new case. Note that we're interested in an answer that depends on the variable values. That means you do not need to plug in the values of the graph. So, the only thing that changes is the expected value. Since mu2 differs from mu1, we cannot combine them. The standard deviation stayed the same since sigma1 and sigma2 and the correlation rho did not change. Note that both formulas are now linear in w1. So that means if we set w1 to 1, we get the metrics of stock 1, and if we set w1 to 0, we get the values of stock 2. This linear relationship is depicted in the plot, where we now see a line with a positive slope. This point representing an equally weighted portfolio falls precisely between the stocks again. This is an important example because it occurs very often in the real world. It resembles a combination of a risk-free bond and some other product, such as Boeing stock. Here, no weighting is superior to another one, and you have to decide how much risk you want to take on. The higher the risk you're willing to accept, the greater the potential reward is. In fact, this key insight can be used to explain leverage. Revisiting the efficiency frontier plot, one might wonder if it's possible to achieve points above the curve. While a single product doesn't allow this, leveraging can. If you have a pure bond position, you start on the green spot on the left. The higher the stock position and the smaller your bond position, the more you move on the black straight line towards the yellow pure stock position. An example midpoint would be a traditional 60-40 bond stock split. However, what happens if W1 becomes negative? By shorting a bond, essentially borrowing funds, you can amplify your stock investment, pushing W2 beyond 1. This strategy is known as leverage and maintains the expected excess return to standard deviation ratio. Theoretically, leveraging allows reaching any point on the line provided you're prepared for the risks. So leverage amplifies both gains and losses, meaning a slight market downturn can significantly impact your portfolio. Note that although this might sound scary, leverage is quite normal for financial institutions and trading companies, but it is of course very important to manage your risk appropriately. So one key insight here is that leverage does not change the ratio between expected value of the excess return and standard deviation. Note that by excess return here, we simply refer to any return generated beyond the risk-free return. So in a world with a 5% risk-free rate, a return of 7% would entail an excess return of 2%. In the next video, we will dive deeper into this concept of the two-asset portfolio and will showcase the benefit of diversification.